All right. Good evening, everybody. The study session of June 28, 2022 is called to order. Donna, would you do a roll call, please? Yes, I will. We have Council Member Bode on Zoom. I'm here. Council Member Sherman. Here. Council Member Good. Here. 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 Council Member McDowell. Present. Here. All right. Tonight we're discussing the Blake and Boise decision. City Attorney Kathleen Haggard has information for us. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me? Yep. Yep. And can you see me? I can. Yeah. yeah, I can. I can see you all. You're very tiny on my screen. Um, <laughs> So I do have a presentation and I actually gave this presentation this morning um, at the task force meeting. And I think a couple of you were present. So bear with me as I go through it all again. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and start my screen share and just give me a thumbs up if it, if it works. Is it working? Almost. It should be. Now you're now you're tiny now. <laughs> oh, okay. Can you see the presentation though? Yes. Great. Um, all right. So as the mayor indicated, um, this presentation is primarily about the legal framework, um, and particularly involving a couple of major cases and also some state legislation that was in response to the cases. And um, I titled the presentation, Not Just a Housing Problem, because I think it's important to understand that there are all sorts of dimensions to this issue. It, housing is a big part of it, but it's also, uh, there's a legal framework to be concerned about. Um, there's also a host of social justice and socioeconomic issues that play into it. Um, and so uh, one thing that I also want everyone to understand is, you know, I've been the city attorney in Shelton since 2007. Um, and so I've been around cities for a very long time. I have never been a criminal prosecutor, so I'm not involved in that aspect of it. So if there are any questions that are really specific to criminal law enforcement, you know, I'll defer those to the chief um, for answering, but this is just sort of the thousand foot uh, broad legal framework. So the first, um, excuse me while I figure out how to advance this. We lost your share. Yeah, um, for some reason it's not letting me advance the slides. Let me try it again. Control something to do it too. Not sure. Okay, is it back up? Yeah, yeah. There you have the slides. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's try it again. No, it's still not allowing me to. Okay, um, well, uh, how about that? Did it advance? Here we go. Great. Right. Okay, this will work well enough. Uh, it won't actually be a slideshow, but close enough. So the first major court decision that I wanted to mention um, was a case that didn't directly have an impact on the issues that you're seeing. It was really the state legislature's follow-up to the case. And that is State v. Blake. Um, and that came out in 2021 at the beginning of the year. And the reason that I first indicate that State v. Blake was the correct result is because I do believe it was correctly decided from a legal standpoint. So what happened in that case was that the Supreme Court ruled that criminalizing unknowing possession of a controlled substance is unconstitutional. So the facts of that case were that there was a young woman who had uh, been served a warrant for potential involvement in some stolen vehicles. And the police found um, in the coin pocket of her jeans, the methamphetamine, 
And, you know, those of you who know how small a coin pocket of genes is, that gives you an idea of how much quantity was actually found. And she responded that she didn't know that the meth was there, that it was a pair of secondhand genes that she'd actually borrowed from a friend. And she had friends also testify that they've never known her to use drugs. She testified that she's never used drugs and she did not know that the meth was there. So on those facts, the court ruled that um, someone who had no idea they were in possession of controlled substances cannot be charged. At the time, Washington was in an extreme minority of states that had what's called a strict liability law for drug possession. And possession of controlled substance, except for marijuana, was a felony. Um, and pretty much every other state or close to every other state had this express knowing requirement in the statute. And the courts, when they got these cases, were already reading this element into the cases and not sustaining convictions or allowing charges to proceed when there wasn't a showing that the person was aware that they had drugs on them. But the court found that the entire law is unconstitutional and therefore the entire law is unenforceable. And that leads us to the next piece of it, which is the chaotic result part of it. So the upshot of the Blake decision was it's retroactive to 1971, meaning that uh, it requires an immediate end to all prosecutions for simple drug possession. And anyone who was convicted of this um, between 1971 and the present um, could request that their conviction be vacated bench warrants that had been issued to pick people up on simple possession charges were recalled, a certain number of inmates were released, and sentences were modified. And the um, arguably most expensive part of this was reimbursement of legal financial obligations, meaning court fines and fees that were levied for simple possession needed to be refunded. And there is state funding that uh, cities and counties are receiving to help um, offset the burden of refunding those obligations. So this has been a very expensive and very time consuming fix as I'm sure um, I see uh, representatives from the court on the line and I'm sure that the, um, the prosecutor and police can confirm that as well. But the piece of it that's more relevant when you're talking about homelessness and how you can respond from a law enforcement standpoint was how the legislature responded to the Blake decision. Um, and that was in ESB 5476 in 2021. And the simple piece of it was that it added the word knowing to the statute, that was a no brainer. Um, it also reduced the penalty for simple possession of controlled substance, any controlled substance, from a felony to a misdemeanor, and encouraged but did not require prosecutors to refer people in possession of controlled substances to services rather than criminal prosecution. It decriminalized possession of paraphernalia for personal use. And it required, and this piece of it was a requirement, local law enforcement, you have to defer, divert individuals to services, assessment and services for drug use at least twice before you can refer them for prosecution. So you pick someone up for various things and one of those things is possession. They have to be referred for services pick them up again, refer for services, and then on the third strike, if you will, they can face prosecution. One thing to point out is this that did not affect arguably more serious drug crimes like manufacture and distribution of drugs. Uh, so that's the end of the discussion on the blank decision and the legislative follow-up. I can't hear anyone particularly well, but does anyone have questions? No questions? Not for this part. 
Okay. So moving on to the second big case, that's Martin v. City of Boise. And this was from the Ninth Circuit. The Ninth Circuit, as you all probably know, is the federal circuit that includes Washington State as well as California, Oregon, Hawaii, um, and a number of other states. It's the largest circuit in the country. And in that decision, the Ninth Circuit held in 2018 that sleeping overnight in a public place cannot be criminalized if the person has no alternative. So meaning they don't have any reasonable access to indoor shelter. The simple fact that they are sleeping outside because essentially they're compelled to sleep outside cannot be a criminal <coughs> offense. And the city of Boise in that case um, argued that shelter space was in fact available. Um, but one of the problems with that was that number one, there wasn't enough shelter space as there isn't enough anywhere pretty much. Um, and some of the shelters that were working in the Boise area were operated by religious institutions, which by itself was fine, it was great, but some of the shelters were actually compelling uh, people to participate in religious exercise. And that's a violation of someone's First Amendment rights if they don't um, follow the particular religion that they are being compelled to exercise. So on that basis, the court deemed that in those circumstances that shelter bed was not truly available. This ruling did not affect um, ordinances that are commonly called sit-lie ordinances. And those um, essentially find on a narrow basis that um, people can't sit or lie on a public sidewalk in certain areas of a city during certain hours. So about 20 or so years ago, 20, 25 years ago, the city of Seattle had its famous sidewalk sitting ordinance, um, where at that point in time, you really couldn't walk through downtown or through the Pike Place Market or some of the more touristy areas without stepping over people, tripping over people. It, it was a pretty significant problem at that time. And so the city of Seattle passed an ordinance precluding people from sitting or lying on the sidewalk in very specific narrow areas of the city during business hours. And the Ninth Circuit ruled that that was acceptable. And the city of Everett a few years ago enacted its own sit lie ordinance because they were having a similar problem in their downtown. So Martin View City of Boise does not prohibit those types of ordinances. The, the Boise case also doesn't prohibit ordinances that prohibit obstruction of the right of way. So for example, if someone is pitching their tent and blocking the entire sidewalk, um, that could be precluded. And courts that have ruled on this issue after Martin v. City of Boise have ruled that cities and counties can have specific areas in the public uh, realm that are not open to camping at any time. Um, as long as the entire city or county isn't off limits. And one of these cases was from one of the Hawaiian islands, which is, was incorporated as its separate county. And it found that it had a few narrow areas of its public parks that were very environment, environmentally sensitive um, and very unusually sensitive to this type of activity. And so it wanted to make those parks off limits and the court ruled that it could do that regardless of whether shelter space was available. So in response to Martin v. City of Boise, uh, in 2021, the end of the year, we, well, the, the, the council, as you recall, enacted uh, Shelton Municipal Code Chapter 8.74, which was a new provision of your code. And it made public camping a misdemeanor but only when either the person is informed that shelter services indoors are available and fails or refuses to go, or the shelter is available, but they won't accept that person due to that person's criminal record or unsafe behavior. And this is a very simple law, it's very straightforward. Um, it 
goes on to say that if someone is removed from their campsite pursuant to the law, then their personal property can be cleared, uh, the tent and their other um, personal effects. We can throw away whatever objects are very clearly refuse or dangerous, unsanitary. We will collect and store whatever personal property is not clearly trash and allow for a period of time to redeem that property. The ordinance defines what available means, and it means that we have verified, a city staff member has verified that there is a shelter that has a bed and will accept the person. The shelter is free to that person. Obviously, it's not free to the taxpayers or the nonprofit or whoever is paying for it, but it's free to the person. Uh, that person can get to the shelter free of charge. Um, and that can be that we transport them. They're able to arrange transportation on their own. They're able to walk, whatever. They're able to get there without having to expend money to get there. And then, of course, as I mentioned from the Boise case, the shelter does not impose requirements that are unrelated to safe operations, for example, religious exercise. Just a word about clearing tent encampments because that can be a big issue too. Certainly it's been a huge issue in city of Seattle that has just these enormous unregulated tent encampments in various places that have been cleared over the years. There was a case out of the Ninth Circuit, city of Los Angeles versus Levin, um, that found that yes, these tent encampments can be cleared, but the city must give a minimum of 72 hours advance notice, must hold any belongings, again, usable belongings, not garbage, not unsanitary uh, refuse, um, for a reasonable period of time to allow reclaiming. Uh, there's a state law case, Washington State, um, State v. Pippin out of the Supreme Court that found that if someone is living in a tent um, or a vehicle that is considered a dwelling unit and is protected from unreasonable search and seizure under the Fourth Amendment, just like someone's house would be. So just like um, the police can't just barge into your house without a warrant, um, these dwelling units are entitled to similar protections from unreasonable search and seizure. They're arguably going to have a lesser degree of protection just because they're, they're, there's not very much between the occupant and the sidewalk, if you will. There's a lot more visibility there, but there's still a modicum of protection. And I believe in July, you're going to be considering another ordinance that talks about these unregulated tent encampments or just you know, single double uh, campsites that pop up on private property and how to go about addressing those when they, when they create a public, nu or public nuisance. In 2020, there was another significant case, City of Seattle v. Long, which went to the Washington State Supreme Court and Mr. Long was living in a truck. Um, he didn't have a home, he was living in his truck and he had parked in a parking lot for a city of Seattle building. And his truck wasn't running so great. Um, he was having trouble driving it. And he had parked in that particular location because it was close to the VA where he was receiving services. Um, but the city, after giving him notice, towed his truck and charged him the impound fees. The city did reduce the fines and fees to about $500, but he still had no means of paying that. So um, a nonprofit legal organization took his case and argued that the impound fees and fines were excessive punishment in violation of the Eighth Amendment. They also argued that towing his vehicle because he was living in it violated the Homestead Act. 
that particular question wasn't addressed by the court because it was found not to be ripe for consideration, but just know that it's out there. Um, the court did agree that the fines and fees were excessive punishment in violation of the Eighth Amendment um, and ruled that, you know, not that you can never charge these fees, excuse me while I block the sun, not that these fines and fees can never be charged, just that at the impound hearing, the court needs to consider the individual's ability to pay those fines. And keep in mind too, that this case does not preclude impounds in any way, shape or form. If someone is blocking a stop sign, they're parked in the fire lane, they're in front of a fire hydrant, they're blocking, they're blocking traffic, they're in a towaway zone, um, they can absolutely be towed because that's a matter of public health, welfare and safety. The court also um, discussed the fact that Mr. Long was parked in a parking lot for the city of Seattle. He was not in a residential neighborhood, leaving open the argument that if he had been on the sidewalk in a residential neighborhood, then perhaps towing his vehicle would have been more reasonable. So this is my final slide. And um, just a disclaimer, I'm not a housing expert. I'm not a homelessness expert. I've been a city attorney for a really long time. And so I've been around this issue. And these are just issues that have come to my attention from doing this work and from reading the case law and kind of just trying to pay attention to the issue. And as I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, homelessness isn't just a housing problem. It's really a combination of issues. Lack of housing is a big one. Um, there is a lack of housing, um, sheer numbers in our communities. And because there is a lack of housing, a shortage of housing, that's driven up the cost of housing dramatically. Rents have risen dramatically and rents have risen faster than people's incomes. Um, that's created a real upward pressure on rents and a downward pressure on the people who need housing. Um, the second big component is mental health. Um, a lot of uh, people who are not able to maintain stable housing have mental health issues. Um, and the third big factor is substance abuse. There was a major uptick in homelessness along with the opiate crisis. And so some of the solutions that I see discussed in um, the, the forums that I have been to and the readings that I have done include short-term solutions, medium-term solutions, and long-term solutions. And just to throw those out, um, obviously shelter space, uh, overnight shelters, emergency shelters, there is not enough of that. There's nowhere close to enough of that. Um, and cities are working very, very hard to try to develop that. Um, the city where I live just purchased um, an old uh, retirement home that had been um, vacated and turned it into a shelter with 60 beds. Um, cities such as Seattle and Spokane, I know, and other cities as well, are developing real-time dashboards um, that allow um, law enforcement, that allow uh, social services professionals, um, as well as shelters to connect in real time um, to be able to see the numbers and see where the beds are. Um, there are also uh, cities and counties and nonprofits opening um, day facilities for services such as showers, uh, toileting, secure storage, phone charging was a big issue. You know, if you're homeless and you're trying to remedy that by staying in touch with your providers, um, maybe looking for jobs, you're gonna need a place to shower, you're gonna need a place to charge your phone. Um, and so making those facilities available is very important. Um, regulated tent cities, um, those are something that really no one wants to see in their neighborhood. But um, in fact, they are much 
safer than having these unregulated tent cities that are popping up all over the place with no constraints. And by regulated tent city, what I generally mean are um, normally it's a religious institution that makes a parking lot or part of their property available um, for a tent city um, for campers to come in and put up tents. Um, they are required to have security. They're required to have um, sanitation facilities um, and have screening from surrounding uh, neighborhoods that may be sensitive. So they are, they turn out to be a much better solution than having these unregulated tents popping up all over the place. Um, another thing are safe parking programs that are offered by public agencies and nonprofits um, where people can go and park a vehicle overnight so they're not parked on the street in a residential neighborhood or in a commercial area. Um, and then a medium term solution, transitional housing, meaning when people are ready to move from um, try to transition into long term housing, transitional housing can help them take that step. There's permanent supportive housing. Um, there's a facility that opened a few years ago in the city where I live. I just heard about a brand new facility in the city of Everett that opened recently. Um, which is a recognition that there's a certain uh, segment of the population that is always going to struggle staying in housing because of mental illness, because of substance abuse, um, because of other, other issues. Um, and so permanent supportive housing um, is housing combined with wraparound services that are there long term. And then finally, affordable housing is another major component in this. Under the Growth Management Act, um, the, the state legislature and the Department of Commerce are leaning very hard right now on primarily the more urban counties, um, King, Pierce, Snohomish, Clark, um, Spokane, um, those counties that have more population to plan for more affordable housing and not just plan for it, but to make it a reality um, because that is just very much needed um, unfortunately, in some areas, we're seeing opposition to that, either from the municipalities themselves or from the community, um, but that is going to continue to be um, a struggle with um, our state legislature and state agencies um, needing to see that as a long-term solution. So that is all I have. Um, I will go ahead and uh, stop sharing and then maybe I can see you all better. Okay. Are there any questions? Okay. Um, I was under the assumption that the Homestead Act is the way it was set up many years ago, that you, you claim a piece of property that no one else owns, right? So how are they getting, is that right? Well, <clears throat> I'm not exactly sure. And I think uh, uh, Kathleen mentioned that the court didn't decide that because uh, the case was decided on other issues. So they didn't have to decide that question. Okay. Um, yeah, the court didn't issue, it didn't address it in that case. In Washington State, the Homestead Act essentially provides that uh, that your dwelling unit can't be attached as enforcement activity. So someone can't take your house that you're living in um, as an enforcement of an obligation. Um, and so it's different than the homestead where you can go take a piece of property and if you farm it for a number of years, it's yours. It's, a, it's the same word, but it's a different meaning. But yes, that's correct. In the city of Seattle long case, that argument was made, but not squarely addressed because the court found that it wasn't ripe for consideration. Okay, thank you. Deputy Mayor. Um, it was in the Boise language, you spoke of sleeping overnight. Um, it seems oddly specific to sleeping and the time of day. Does that apply during daytime? Is it sleeping? Uh, is it laying down? on the ground, kind of what's the, is it black and white on that front? 
Yeah, the boys in case was very specific to sleeping overnight. Um, and uh, where I think the daytime issues come in is with the sit lie ordinances, um, because people tend to sleep at night and need you know a place to kind of bunker down at night. That's a separate consideration from you know in the daytime when arguably people can move around better and other people are trying to access businesses. So yes, the Martin v. Boise case was very specific to overnight. Um, lodging, if you will. Thank you. And a follow-up question on location. How far away is too far away for a shelter location? It really depends on the facts. Um, I would think that it's going to be a combination of number one, can they get there for free? That's the biggest consideration because if they can't, then we're in violation of our own ordinance and as well as uh, Martin V City of Boise. So that's one consideration. Another consideration is, um, are they tied to services in a particular area? So is someone gonna say, you know, if you ship me to Tacoma, I can't access my um, probation officer or my um, counselor or my uh, physician that's prescribing me my medication for my bipolar disorder. Um, you could potentially run into those types of issues. And in fact, that issue came up squarely in the city of Seattle, the long case where um, he said, you know, the reason I'm parked here is because I'm trying to go to the VA for treatment. And the court was very sympathetic to that. So I think we have to be aware to the possibility that, um, yeah, it might be reasonable to get some people to Olympia if Olympia has space, but it's not gonna be reasonable for everybody. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you, Kathleen. Thanks. You're welcome. All right. Any discussion questions for Jeff? I do. Okay. I have a list. Am I allowed to go through all of them or just one at a time? Sure. Go for it. All right. So um, first of all, was if we have to hold their property for 60 days, where do we hold it? Great question. Uh, so we have a conics box uh, at the, and this is one of the things Chief Moody was working on right before uh, he retired uh, at the wastewater treatment plant. Well, it might be complicated <clears throat> to know who's is whose things, but anyway. Yeah. Well, we have, uh, we had to set that up. If you'll remember, we did the big camp cleanup on the hillside uh, right above SR3. Mm -hmm. uh, so we set that up at that time uh, as part of that cleanup. Okay. And then um, she said that the shelter cannot impose like religious requirements, mm -hmm. but what rules can they make? Anything for the safe, uh, safe operation of the shelter. So they can make uh, requirements uh, like no weapons, um, that type of thing. And then, um, so it said clearing temporary encampments, they need 24 hour requirement ahead of time. 72. 72. So, okay, 72 hours. Um, is this for public private property or what if it was in my yard? Mm -hmm. uh, so, well, if it was in your front yard, uh, presumably it wouldn't be allowed to be established there. Um, typically what we're looking at there is uh, somewhere on private property in the woods. So like for the one, and I'll go back to the example of the camp above SR3, we actually posted that for a week uh, prior to just to make sure we overdid the 72 hour requirement. But in your front yard, I- Or if I have an empty lot in town. Yeah, then that would have to be a 72 hour uh, notification. And then- um, For us to do. Okay. Um, and then the part about if your home is your camper, what if the said person has a history of violence, maybe against children, but they're- Maybe they're parked near a school, a daycare, a park where children play. Uh, are there rules and guidelines on that? I think that would be separate. I believe there's a 600 foot, if I'm not mistaken. If they are a uh, sex registrant where they have those conditions, mm -hmm. then that would apply whether they are homeless or not. Uh, mm -hmm. And enforcement can be taken on that depending on what their conditions are. 
Okay. And then, um, so there's this is one that just came into my head. It really doesn't have anything to do with what she talked about too much, but like campers that are in town, I have seen them plugged into public entities for power. Mm -hmm. So do we have rules and guidelines on that, like the clock tower? What are the rules and guidelines on that? Well, they have to have permission to access our power. So uh, we could disconnect them from power. You know, whether we could make them uh, immediately leave is a different, uh, different topic. Right, but you would ask them to unplug? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. And the same is true for private businesses, like if uh, there's a water connection. Mm -hmm. so. Okay, thank you very much. All right, any other questions, comments? Any items for new discussion? Nope. The study session is adjourned at 6.35 p.m.